I guess we should begin by saying good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on the time, or maybe even good night, depending on the time that you're seeing uh, this. I'm uh, pleased to present this lecture on behalf of the Sarah, uh, Sarah and Sam Schofer Holocaust Resource Center at Stockton University, which has been my home away from home for the last uh, 20 some odd years. Uh, I've taught there, I've lectured there, I've worked on a whole range of projects, and I've had nothing but the deepest respect for all of the work that Stockton University has done, but really most particularly for the work that the Holocaust Resource Center um, has done. Uh, first of all, I hope that all of you are remaining safe and healthy, and we all should, all should wish each other safety and health in these trying and difficult times. Uh, and uh, let's begin. I, I want to begin in a fundamental way by saying there is no quite, really no parallel to the Holocaust, but the Holocaust has much to teach, uh, especially for these trying times. I want to review two concepts with you uh, that hopefully will not end up describing the situation that we have to face in the future. Um, the great literary scholar Lawrence Langer uh, developed a concept called choiceless choices. And one of the most important writers of the last generation, uh, Bill Styron, William Styron, who wrote The Confessions of Matt Turner and also uh, wrote a book uh, called Sophie's Choice, develop the concept of what Sophie's Choice is about. Let me begin backwards with Sophie's Choice and then go to the more developed concept by Lawrence Langer. Sophie's Choice is the story of a um, survivor of Auschwitz, a Polish non-Jew, who when she came in and an upper class Polish non-Jew in the movie, it's played by Meryl Streep in the book, it's nondescript. But um, when she came to Auschwitz, the, um, the officer who made the selection presented her with the following choice, which is that she could choose one of her children, but not both. One of her children would be sent to death and one of her children could stay with her. And because she was a Polish prisoner, she was not automatically or immediately condemned to die. Let's remember that every Jewish woman who arrived with children had no such choice. Upon arrival, all that you brought with, uh, with you was left behind. Men were divided on one side, women uh, were divided on the, the other, and children who were young were sent with their mothers. Selection was based on whether you were young and healthy and whether at that moment in time the um, Nazis needed slave labor. And inevitably the old and the very young and women with children were sent to their death. Sophie, because she was Polish and because a uh, Polish non-Jew and because she faced a different situation uh, and could not immediately be put to death, um, was given a horrific choice, which is you can save one of your children and not both. In the book, it's remarkable that William Styron will not go there. He will not... Um, in other words, face what happened uh, to Sophie. He doesn't believe it's within his capacity as a writer or as a novelist. It's within his capacity to enter into the mind of a woman who has to decide which of her children to save. And he says, someday I will understand Auschwitz. This was a brave statement, but innocently absurd. No one will ever understand Auschwitz. What I might have to set down with more accuracy might have been, someday I will write about Sophie's life and death and thereby help demonstrate how absolutely evil is, um, evil is never extinguished from the world. Auschwitz itself remains inexplicable. The most profound statement yet, about, uh, yet uh, made about Auschwitz was not a statement uh, at all but a response. 
the query at Auschwitz, tell me where was God? And the answer, where was man? So what Styron does at that moment is not enter into the mind of Sophie because he can't. He believes there's something I can't go near, I can't touch. So instead he withdraws and asks, what are the circumstances that could lead a perpetrator to force a warm mother to decide between which of her children she saves and which of the children she allows to die? Um, interestingly enough, in the film, and this is absolutely the most riveting scene in the film, it's the film that haunts us if we see the film when we're young and merely children. It's the scene that haunts us if we see the film later when we are parents. Meryl Streep, who plays the part of Sophie, has to enter into the character of Sophie and internalize what it must have been at that moment. She screams, I can't. I can't. And then the perpetrator, the officer says, you must, you must, I'll take both of them. And finally, she pushes one of her children toward him. The child screams and she screams. And the anguish in her face tells you that you can't quite face that circumstance. And this is the terrible choice that you make on the occasions, the tragic occasions, where you can save some and not all. Uh, and in this case, the choice was imposed upon her. It wasn't a choice of actual life. Lawrence Langer, the great literary scholar of the Holocaust, and the man who more deeply than anyone else forced us to look at the way in which the Holocaust shatters all of our norms of judgment and our norms of choosing good or evil as a simple choice, developed the concept of choiceless choices, which is the idea that you have to choice be, to choose between the morally evil and the morally horrific, between that which is outrageous and that which is impossible. And you don't, as we have in ordinary life, to make a choice of what is good and what is bad, but you have to cho choose between two evils in a situation that's not of our making. And what he says is that collapses the ordinary standards of moral judgment that we have. And we run the terrible risk at this moment that if things get fully out of hand, then that might be a situation imposed upon society. And it may actually be a situation imposed upon the physicians and the nurses were scrambling to grapple with a pandemic. Let's, let me begin with a conversation that I had yesterday. I've been spending my time in part trying to get a lot of work done because what else am I going to do with all this time? In part trying to support my family, support my family emotionally, economically is thankfully not the issue at this moment, though I suspect for many of us, our economic life is going to change. Um, but I've been calling my friends who are of a certain age and asking them how they are and really telling them essentially that I care for them, I'm concerned about them, I feel for them. I've been uh, two people lost, 97 and 95 year old, fathers in our community. I've been spending some time on the phone with them, paying a shiva call and with the idea that even though you can't hug someone, we can have remote hugging, remote embracing, remote touching, remote uh, engaging. And we, even if we can't be there, it doesn't relieve us of the obligation to be there. I spoke to an 88 year old um, 
friend of mine whose wife is 90, and uh, he's a Holocaust survivor, spent the wartime years in Shanghai. And he said quite candidly, I, I, I said, what steps you take to protect yourself? He said, everything imaginable. He said, because I understand that if I go to the hospital, I'm 88, my wife is 90. Uh, they're not going to waste the resources on us when they can use it for a young, younger person, a much younger person who has many more years of life. So he said, I can't get sick at this moment. And it dawned on me that that's some of the choiceless choices that our physicians may have to make. And the choiceless choices are going to be, whom do you, whom do you save and whom do you not save? Who do you give priority and who do you not give priority? We've already seen some of it in the question of whether we have elective surgery and non-elective surgery whether people with other conditions should go to the hospital, whether indeed you should go to the emergency room if you're not feeling well because the emergency room itself may be contagious, dangerous, and difficult for you. And the question becomes, how do we allocate resources? Now, how do we allocate resources are going to be a question made in every hospital room. It's going to be a question done on the national and state level with the question of how many masks do we have and how many gowns do we have? Do we, for example, protect and test um, medical personnel first because they can heal all sorts of other people? Uh, or do we uh, test people randomly upon arrival because in hospitals, for example, first come, first serve, except in the most dangerous of cases? And we're going to face all sorts of choices for the allocation of resources and choices that we have no clear guidance to. Uh, the government is now facing choices and we see a little bit restlessness of this. Do we choose between the health of the American people and the economic well-being of the American people? Or do we really restrain ourselves at that point from all social contact and all economic commerce uh, because we understand that health takes a priority and that the it, 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 health, then if people die, they have no tomorrow. If the economy changes, we will have a tomorrow when the economy will have an opportunity to grow. So these are some of the issues that you get when you study the Holocaust, because one of the real questions is, and one of the fascinations of studying the Holocaust, is you face life and death decisions that ordinarily we face once or twice in a lifetime. Survivors face them only almost on a daily basis. I got a... Um, call from a reporter yesterday who asked me a very interesting question. He asked me a question, do you know a survivor who lived life in hiding? And the reason for that is we're living an awful lot of life in isolation today. And it's the equivalent, not that we're hiding from someone, but we're hiding ourselves, we're sequestering ourselves from what from the virus, and consequently, we are caught in a very limited universe in which we have to depend upon each other and make sure that we are careful with each other and cautious with each other. I kept thinking back to uh, a very interesting uh, book by a man who may be known to some of you, uh, Felix Zahnman. Philip Zahnman was the head of the Vichy Corporation, which was a large corporation in Philadelphia. And he survived for a year and a half with three other people in hiding in a one and a half foot crawl space basement, what we call a California basement, which you on the East Coast don't know about. And that is the crawl space under the floor. And those of us who live in California miss the large basements which is where you could put stuff, where you could have utensils and, and all sorts of things that you could put away. We miss that sort of um, uh, added space. And Felix um, Zahnman wrote that 
the two most important things at that point were fairness and equality. So what did they do to be fair? Well, we'll tell you the story in a couple of ways. And one of this is going to be a bit more candid than you may want. One person went out every day to get the food, which was a deeply dangerous moment. And then when they divided the food, one person cut the food, but four people draw, drew straws as to who would get the first choice of food, the second choice of food, the third choice of food, and the fourth choice of food. So it was the obligation of the person cutting the food to what? Cut it uh, exactly evenly because he or she did not know which portion of food they would get. And because they didn't know which portion of food they would get, which portion of food the person they cared for would get, which portion of food somebody else would get, they uh, each had to cut the food exactly accurately to be meticulously fair and therefore to distribute it evenly, and the process had to be fair so that nobody turned against each other and nobody was, what, um, uh, angry at each other. They even did something else, which is they, uh, there were three men and a woman, and they made a decision very early on, since they were all uh, teenagers or people in their early 20s, they made a decision very early on that there would be sex for everyone or sex for no one. And consequently, there was sex for no one because they couldn't stand the possibility of people turning against each other and having the normal rivalries that are involved when you have three men and one woman and everybody playing for the other person's favor. I think we learned something from this. We can learn something from this that we have to be very considerate and very careful in order to survive in these cramped situations. And even if many of us have comfortable homes with many rooms, we are really living on top of each other. And consequently, we have to be careful. Consequently, we have to be fair. And consequently, we have to bend over backwards to be considerate. And perhaps the other thing is we have to share whatever dangers there are in an equalized way in terms of who goes shopping, who provides food, who brings food into the house, and what's done. And everybody must bend over backwards to be supportive, creative, and um, mutually enforcing. What's the other part of it, which is um, in hiding, People have to spend an awful lot of time making sure that the days don't drone on and on and on and they're boring and boring and boring. And therefore, they have to keep the mind alive and keep the spirit nourished. We thankfully have vast resources never available to anyone in hiding. And the vast resources include this incredible invention of the internet, which is being tested and tried in our moment in time, all of the resources that are available on the internet, and even the resources that Stockton University and its Sam and, and Sarah Schofer, a Holocaust Resource Center are providing for you by this lecture and the opportunity to engage and discuss and to consider we have these resources and the mind must be kept alive and the mind must be nourished. Television is one resource of it and um, um, books are another resource of it. Movies are a third resource of it. Music is a fourth resource. And then all of the opportunities to explore the whole range of the net to keep the mind alive, the spirit alive, and we must do that in this incredible moment in time. And then we may even have to um, consider the wisdom from a profound Christian source, uh, which is the famous statement of um, Saint, uh, Saint Francis 
uh, of Assisi, who said, O oh Lord, give me the courage to change what can be changed, the strength to accept what cannot be changed, and the wisdom to know the difference. This is a statement sometimes used in Alcoholics Anonymous, but it's a statement that can guide us in life in the sense that we need strength, we need courage, and we need wisdom. And we have to understand that there are certain things at this moment we cannot change, and certain things that we can change, and we need to know the difference. And part of what we can't change are the circumstances that we're facing Some of us can change it if we're medical personnel. Some of us can change it if we're government officials. Some of us can change it if we're teachers and lecturers. But most of us have to accept that there are limits to what we can change. Uh, And consequently, we need the strength to accept what we can't change. And we can't bemoan the fact. My own daughter... came back from um, college. She's a a freshman after a gap year at college, came back from college, and she was horrendously angry that her college semester was being taken away from her, including the fact that she said, my God, in the first semester I loved my studies, but I didn't have friends, and since I came back, I now have friends and also have wonderful studies. Life was terrific, and now they're stealing it from me. They're taking it from me and the like, and gradually she had to come to realization that that's the reality and needed the strength to take it. My own son came back from Australia yesterday, yesterday, I guess, which is uh, Sunday, uh, March 22nd. He was on his junior year in Australia, um, Australia, and uh, Australia was a little bit less dangerous than we are at this point, but uh, his program had ended. It will now go online, and he was not sure when he could come back to the United States. So he, too, went through rage and anger, and after rage and anger, there comes an acceptance and a sense that we have to do what we have to do in the current situations. Let's take one more very important lesson from the Holocaust, Uh, perhaps the most important lesson, which is embodied in the life of survivors. Embodied in the life of survivors is they are victims, but they're also symbols of resilience because they taught us something incredible, which is how to rebuild in the aftermath of destruction. They had lost everything and everyone. Some had lost spouses and children. Some all had lost homes and cities and communities and parents and siblings. And defeat does not have to be the final word and loss does not have to be the final word. What can happen in the aftermath is And this is going to be the life force, the incredible life force that has to take hold of us once this danger passes or once it gets to a critical sense that we can resume life as normal, which is a double down, a triple down, a quadruple down on the zest for life, the passion for life. Let me illustrate it to you in a, in a, 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 a peculiar statistic. The um, highest birth rate in all of Europe in the aftermath of the Holocaust were the survivors. Germans were not giving birth to children. Frenchmen were not giving birth to children. Russia, which had which had uh, suffered enormous, Soviet Union, which had suffered enormous devastation, were not giving birth to children but survivors were giving birth to children. Um, Part of that was a combination of desperation. Part of that may also be attributed to the fact that women imagined that after ceasing to menstruate in Auschwitz, they could no longer give birth to children. 
they didn't realize then that uh, pressure and starvation uh, caused the cessation of menstruation. But the most important part of it was in the aftermath of death and destruction, they felt there had to be the recreation of life. In my work in recent years, I've said that the most pivotal moment in Jewish history uh, in recent times occurred in 1945-46 when these survivors chose in the deepest and most passionate and most important sense of life, chose life and decided to rebuild, restore, renew and recreate. And they have become the demonstration of uh, resilience to our world and consequently, we have to accept that these times are temporary, hopefully. And then once we're given the opportunity, we have to resume life with a zest, with a passion, but also having learned what's most important during this time, which is a sense of responsibility one for another and a sense of, of, of um, preserving our inner integrity and our inner, our inner selves, despite the abject conditions that we're facing in these circumstances. Most of us are hopefully not facing starvation and poverty. We have an enemy, but the enemy is an unseen, still unknown enemy. And most of us have the safety to retreat into that. We have to take that into ourselves and then come back from that with a tremendous and important zest and passion for life. Thank you very much and have a good day.